Russell Ramos has been working in the industrial refrigeration service and sales for 41 years. Russell has served as the national president of RITA and is still active in RITA and other industrial trade organizations. Russell has been married to his wife, Terry, for 41 years. They have five adult children and 5.5 grandchildren. Russell holds a bachelor's degree in engineering from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Why do we have refrigeration? General topic here. One answer is to provide, provide safe food to the world. But there are many other reasons and many other processes. Some in the chemical industry, uh, making ice. Now we use ice in the, in the food industry, but they also use a tremendous amount of ice in mixing with concrete when they make dams. It has to do with the curing process. Some chemical plants use it to separate gases because they're heavier at different temperatures. So there are many reasons for refrigeration, not to mention just a good old basic air conditioning system. The session goal is that the participant has an understanding of the refrigeration process when ammonia is the refrigerant. Actually, the refrigeration cycle is the same. Doesn't matter if it's ammonia or R22 or R134A or even CO2. The cycle's the same. What's different is the pressures and the temperatures that a given refrigerant has. The general topics, again, for this conversation today will be reviewing terminology, explaining the components, fundamentals of refrigeration and heat transfer, and understand the physical processes involved in heat transfer. This is one of a handful of uh, basic system drawings that you'll see today throughout this presentation. This one is titled The Four Components of the Refrigeration Cycle, and there are only four. Everything else I call bells and whistles. So there's only four components here. I like to start at the evaporator, which is this item here. That's where we feed liquid refrigerant into the evaporator. The liquid absorbs heat from the product, turns the liquid refrigerant to vapor. The vapor gets drawn over to the compressor. The compressor compresses the low pressure vapor to high pressure vapor. The high pressure vapor goes down to a next component called the condenser. And the high pressure vapor gives up the heat to a colder uh, substance, usually air or water. And we condense the vapor back into liquid. And then the liquid by pressure differential is fed over to the expansion valve. And from here we go to high, from high pressure liquid to low pressure liquid. And then we meter, we expand or meter that liquid refrigerant into the evaporator and just start to cycle all over again. If you look closely between the expansion valve, there's a line here that goes over to between the suction and the discharge of the compressor. On the top there, it says low side. On the bottom, it says high side. So that divides the low pressure side and the high pressure side of the system. The purplish colors up here are the low pressure side from the outlet of the expansion valve to the inlet of the compressor on the suction side. And the high pressure side of the system is from the discharge or outlet of the compressor through the condenser and to the inlet of the expansion valve. Low side, high side. Four components, compressor, condenser, metering valve or expansion valve, and the evaporator. Okay, before we get into the refrigeration fundamentals, I want to take a few minutes to talk about safety. What is the big picture for today's safety seminar? To do our jobs better, to get better at what we do and how we do it, to provide a means for all of us to gain more knowledge. Because through knowledge, you, your co-workers, your employees, your plants, meaning your facilities, and our industry becomes safer. Remember, the basics of refrigeration starts with the basics of safety. 
What is the significance of this picture? Who is using these tools? This picture serves as a reminder to me, a constant reminder. Fact, the overwhelming majority of accidents and releases are caused by operators and technicians who are working on the systems. They are out there working on the system with their hands and tools. They are taking things apart and they are putting things back together. Here are some examples of how and when operators may cause accidents. And I'm not suggesting anybody is unintelligent or intentionally trying to cause accidents. I've caused accidents and I don't consider myself to be a dumb person. Don't go out and ask many of my friends, please. They'll have a different opinion. But the point is we're human beings and we make mistakes. We need, we can never stop learning. So that's what today is about. So here's some examples of how accidents can happen. Starting up a system, lowering the suction, the system suction pressure too rapidly, shutting down a system, disconnecting a system, simply closing or opening a single hand valve that could be catastrophic if you trap liquid refrigerant. Next bullet point, adding ammonia to the system. Performing maintenance, draining oil, servicing compressors, replacing valves or shaft seals, etc., etc. How about during pump outs and pump downs? The point here is quite simply this. There is a very real human element to operating and maintaining an ammonia refrigeration system. Newsflash, ammonia refrigeration systems don't maintain themselves. Ammonia systems are usually larger capacity and larger horsepower systems which means they have additional components like vessels and transfer systems, sometimes with pumps and regulators and controls and many safeties, etc., etc. So this ammonia safety seminar today, or maybe even this presentation, may offer you an opportunity to increase your personal knowledge Therefore, your safety level of your ammonia refrigeration system. Your job is to listen and to ask questions. And finally, to make some new contacts who can help you find the answers to these questions and maybe other questions. So let's go learn something. Learning is an attitude. Let's get excited about learning. Let's get excited about learning so we can eventually teach. Let's go for it. Bring your A game. Let's get it on. We'll start with our basic refrigeration discussion. We have terminology and all these names just jump out at us. And it gets confusing. Heat transfer, BTUs, compressor, temperature, condenser, liquid and vapor, high side, low side, suction, discharge, pressure, temperature, pressure temperature, heat, condensing, molecules. Why the heck would we want to know about molecules? Well, all this has to come into focus, and that's where the, the terminology starts. Basic refrigeration. So let's start with the definition of a refrigeration process and then talk about the purpose of a refrigeration process. So we'll do a definition and talk about the purpose. The definition of a refrigeration process. Refrigeration may be defined as the process by which heat is removed from a place or an object where it is not wanted 
and then transferred to an area where it does no harm. Usually that's the atmosphere. The purpose of a refrigeration process. The purpose of a refrigeration system is to maintain or achieve a specific temperature. Please note in the purpose we're talking about the word temperature. When we defined the refrigeration process, we were talking about moving heat. Are heat and temperature the same thing? I don't think so. And that's part of the mystery of refrigeration. And that's why it's so important we understand this. So I always say it's all about the heat. So before we explain the difference between heat and temperature, I want to make a comment. What's your job? If you are a refrigeration system operator or a refrigeration system technician or supervisor or a refrigeration system chief engineer, you must understand that you get paid to transport heat. A refrigeration system is a transportation system and it is specifically designed to transport heat or heat energy. So it is your job to understand everything that makes up that transportation system. Where do you load the heat? What is carrying the heat? How do you transport that heat away? How do you unload that heat when it arrives at the final destination? And where do you put the heat? It's all about the heat. Where is it? What temperature is it at? What temperature do we want to get it to? How much heat do we want to remove? How do we remove the heat? All questions we have to know the answers to. Well, where's the heat? The heat is always in the product. We are refrigeration people, so we are always removing heat from a product to make that product colder, to cool it down. If we were in the heating business, we'd be heating up the product, and sometimes you do that, but we're refrigeration people. So this example has pallets of strawberries that might be coming in at 75 degrees from the field. Our job is to figure out how much heat is in that pallet of strawberries what temperature it's coming in at, coming in at what temperature we want to get it down to and how do we do that the how is a good question because you could just say blow air over it it might be the right answer some products you shower cold water over some products you do different things with so um great questions all so to review, where is the heat? In the product. It's always in the product. And it's your job to know what the product is or what the products are in your process. Here, it's strawberries. Yours might be milk. You might be cooling beer or wine. You might be cooling melons or lettuce or apples or peaches or pears. You might be cooling or freezing chicken parts or pies or cookie dough or ice cream or popsicles you need to know what your product is in fact if you're making ice at that part of your system the product is water if you're cooling water or glycol or brine to send it out to other processes to bring the heat back to the evaporator then in that process, your product is the fluid water, or it is the brine, or it is the glycol. You need to know what your product is. Many plants have multiple products that they're cooling. In this example, our product is at 75 degrees, and we want to cool it down to 32 degrees. How much heat do we want to remove? We have to ask that question, and right now we don't know. 
because we have to calculate it. And to calculate it, we have to know the mass. Last question, how do we remove the heat? Well, we haven't got there yet, so, t so stay tuned. Now we're going to define heat a little more. How do we define heat? There's two, two qualities that define heat. We call them quantity and intensity. Quantity is simply measuring, finding a way to measure how much heat we have present. Easier said than explained. Intensity is talking about the uh, temperature in terms of uh, molecular activity. So what is heat? The two characteristics are quantity and temperature. Quantity is defining how much heat, the quantity of heat. Temperature is defining how high or low how hot or cold the temperature is. Think of a cup of coffee. Um, it's easy for you to measure the temperature of that. You stick a thermometer in it. But it's not so easy. In fact, there's nothing that you can stick in the cup of coffee to tell you the quantity of heat. You have to do a calculation. If you think back to our palette of strawberries, we can tell what temperature or the average temperature of the strawberries are, but we have no idea what the total amount of heat is until we do a calculation. So what is temperature? It is a measure of the intensity of the average vibrational speed of the atoms of the object. The higher the vibrational speed, the higher the temperature, therefore the object is hotter. The common unit in America is the degree Fahrenheit. So we commonly measure temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So let's go back to the molecules and the atoms. I interchange those terms. The atom is the smallest whole part of matter. <clears throat> so for example, an ammonia molecule is made up of one atom of nitrogen and three atoms of hydrogen, in H3. A water molecule is made, made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. The point is those atoms, therefore those molecules, vibrate. They're always vibrating unless they're at absolute zero. Absolute zero means there's no heat present and the molecules are dead still. All the molecules we come in contact with and they're not sure anywhere in the universe is at absolute zero. So the molecules are vibrating. The hotter they get, the faster they vibrate, the more intensely they vibrate. The slower they get when we remove heat from them, <clears throat> the molecules are vibrating at a slower vibrational speed, less intensity. So to measure that cup of coffee or to measure a product, it's pretty simple. We can use a thermometer. Just get a thermometer and stick it in the product or swirl it in the drink. This thermometer is reading minus 27 degrees Fahrenheit. It just happens to be reading uh, the temperature of uh, liquid ammonia that's in a plastic test tube that's boiling. Uh, it's the best picture I had of a thermometer. But you all know what a thermometer is. And that's pretty easy. We can get the temperature, but that's only one of the two um characteristics that define heat. The other one's a little trickier to explain. Come on. So let's talk about that other characteristic called quantity. The BTU, or you could use calories if you're in, in Europe, BTUs define the quantity. The definition of a BTU, by the way, that's energy. We're talking heat energy here. The definition of a BTU is the amount of heat energy it takes to change one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. And the degrees, just like we talked about a few minutes ago, define the intensity or how fast the molecules are vibrating or how slow they're vibrating. That's what a thermometer does. It tells you how fast or slow molecules are vibrating and gives you an average number. 
but the BTU is a measurement of energy or the quantity. The example is uh, if you could take a good old fashioned wooden kitchen match and you have a pound of water. The heat coming from that match will raise the temperature of one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. So if you started at 50 degrees and you struck that match and held it under the water and theoretically of all that energy from the match goes into the one pound of water, when you're done with that match, the, the one pound of water that was at 50 degrees will now be at 51 degrees. That's the definition of a BTU. Now it doesn't matter if you're, doesn't matter if you're heating up the water or cooling the water. It's still one degree per pound. Final bullet point here says systems are designed to absorb and reject BTUs of heat energy because that's the way we measure it. Back to my favorite saying, it's all about the heat. So let's close the loop on BTUs and temperature. Where's the heat? In our example, it's in the strawberries. There's a pallet of strawberries. What temperature is the incoming product? Those strawberries are at 75 degrees. What temperature do we want to get the product down to? We want to get to 32 degrees. How much heat do we need to remove? Well, the number is a calculated one, and I'll go through that calculation. We use the equation Q equals M times mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. Well, I've assigned 600 pounds of weight to that pallet of strawberries. The specific heat for strawberries is 0.92 BTUs per pound per degree Fahrenheit. And the change in temperature, we're going to lower those strawberries in a cooling process from 75 degrees down to 32 degrees. That's a delta T or a change in temperature of 43 degrees. We simply multiply these numbers, 600 times 0.92 times 43, and we get 23,736 BTUs. The importance of all of this is it's easy to get a temperature of the air we're standing in or the water that we're drinking or the swimming pool we're swimming in. We just use a thermometer. What's not so easy to get is the BTUs or the total amount of heat because we have to know the mass. And this equation gives us the, uh, the abilities to calculate BTUs. The reason uh, we want to know that as refrigeration people is because we have to calculate. We're not so interested in the raw amount of heat energy in a product. We want to know, in this case, how many BTUs we need to remove to take that heat from 75 degrees down to 32 degrees. How many BTUs do we have to remove to take 600 pounds of strawberries from 75 degrees down to 32 degrees? The answer is 23,736. We're transitioning into a section to talk about heat transfer now. So my favorite saying it still applies to the three states of matter. It's all about the heat. Three states of matter are solids, liquids, and vapors. Or you can start the other way. But I want to explain, again, with a molecular discussion, the differences between solids, liquids, and vapors. We're going to use water as an example. And the lowest temperature form of water would be ice. In any solid, this is carbon steel, stainless steel, wood, what have you. In the solid form, the molecules are lined up like soldiers. They are attracted to each other with a kind of a magnetic planetary force. But those molecules, and the molecules move. They're always vibrating. And there's a tremendous amount of space between the molecules, each individually. And they're vibrating and they're bouncing off of each other, but they don't change positions. That's a solid. As you warm up the ice or the solid, the molecules will vibrate faster and faster and faster. And when they vibrate so rapidly that they overcome this magnetism, this force, that's called the melting point or a phase change. And in the case of ice, you melt from a solid into a liquid. On the molecular level, what that means is 
The molecules are still attracted to each other, but they can take the shape of the container or they'll melt, but they still are attracted to each other. If you continue to add heat to the liquid, the molecules vibrate faster and faster and faster until you get all the way up to the uh, boiling point, is what we call it, which is the next phase change. And the molecules are vibrating so rapidly that they overcome the attraction to the other molecules and they fly out into the space or the atmosphere or the air. And that's the vapor state or the gas state. So you start with a solid, you add heat, you get to a melting point, and the molecules are now released. They're still attracted to each other, but they're not locked into position. And when you continue to add heat to the liquid, when you get to the boiling point, those molecules overcome that attraction and they fly out into the, into the atmosphere. Now the reverse happens. If you cool down those molecules that are out in the atmosphere, when they get lose enough energy and the vibrational energy gets low enough and slow enough, they recombine. And enough water molecules recombine you, ha recombine, you have water droplets, and that's called condensation or condensing. And that's how they form back into liquid. If you take that liquid water and you continue to remove the heat from it, slow it down, slow the molecules down, then you will freeze and reform into a solid. So that's solids, liquids, and gases. That's the whole universe as far as we know it. And you have a phase change in between each one. So we're trying to get to how energy moves. And again, it's all by molecules. It takes a temperature difference. So a temperature difference is the, the higher, well, rule number one. Heat always moves or transfers from a hotter object to a colder object. Everything in nature goes from high to low. Pressure goes from high to low. Voltage goes from high to low. And the heat energy and the collision of molecules, the heat transfer is from the higher energy molecules to the lower energy molecules. So it's always from high temp to low temp. The last bullet says the greater the temperature difference, the faster the heat moves. So again, talking about that transfer of heat, I just have a little cheesy drawing there to kind of show the molecules are vibrating and they're moving. This is representing a solid. And the mo that, that turquoise molecule in the middle will always vibrate or contact or bounce off of those five or six molecules that are surrounding it. If you add heat to one side of that equation, the molecules will vibrate faster and transfer the heat through, just like hitting a rack of pool balls on the number one ball. The balls on the end shoot off first. In our world of refrigeration, the heat energy is transported or transferred mechanically. And that means mechanically by a molecule bouncing off of other molecules. And I call this the collisions, collisions, collisions. Said in a different way, our, in our world of refrigeration, all heat transfer happens when one molecule collides with another molecule. Times billions and billions and billions. Again, higher energy molecules and lower energy molecules colliding and the higher energy molecules transfer their heat to the lower energy molecules. Talked about change of state a little earlier, but I'll review it. Um, again, solids, liquids, and vapors. So if you're going from a solid to a liquid, you're adding heat to the solid, you're bombarding the solid with higher energy molecules, and you're heating it up and you get it past the melting point because you're adding heat to the solid. Now, if you reverse that, you can take, you can bounce lower energy molecules off of the liquid and cool the liquid down and take the liquid back to a solid that's called freezing. That's removing heat from the liquid. On the other end of the scale, when you have liquid and you add heat to it, we go to a vapor that's called boiling, which means we're adding heat to the liquid. And the opposite of that is, that is removing heat 
from the vapor, we condense back into a liquid. That's called condensing. The direction of heat movement defines the nature of the change. Adding heat to ice means we're melting into liquid. Adding heat to liquid means we're boiling and vice versa. In what ways does heat energy move or transfer? We have conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is, uh, my words, molecule to molecule through solids. Um, that's from those molecules bouncing off each other. But it's like grabbing a hot piece, a hot pipe, or maybe a pot that's in the in the fire, and it'll eventually work up the handle to your hand. So it's through a solid. Convection is molecule to molecule via fluids. Fluids would be liquids or air. And we do a tremendous amount of uh, heat transfer using convection. If we put a fan on air, we call it forced convection. And we do a tremendous amount of cooling with air in our refrigeration industry. The last one is, is not very common, but it's, uh, it's radiation. Um, if you have lights in your room, it's not a big part of our heat transfer world, but uh, radiation is light waves like sunlight exciting molecules in the solids and fluids upon uh, contact. So when the sun shines on your arm or the sun shines on uh, a metal pipe, that's uh, heating by radiation. What is pressure? Pressure is a measure of a force over a given area. Uh, one pound of force applied to one square inch of area is one PSI one pound per square inch. The reason we're talking about pressure is we have to have a moving force in the refrigeration system to move the fluids, to move the... Uh, here's a pressure gauge reading zero, atmospheric pressure, uh, but that's the instrument we would use to read pressure. Why does the refrigerant move? Well, the refrigerant moves within the system by pressure difference. So if you have a higher pressure pushing to a lower pressure, We'll either make the uh, liquid refrigerant move or we'll make the vapor refrigerant move. The direction of flow is always from high pressure to low pressure. Does that sound familiar? Just like high temperature to low temperature. When we talk about pressures and temperatures, now we have a thing called a pressure temperature relationship of refrigerants. This defines the saturation points, which means the boiling points and the condensing points of a refrigerant. A saturated liquid is a liquid at a pressure temperature that is ready to boil when more heat from a hotter object is applied to it. And a saturated vapor is a vapor at a pressure temperature that is ready to condense when heat is removed from the vapor. Pressure temperature relationships of refrigerants. Here's some examples. This is uh, one of the main items that defines each refrigerant. There are many more. Latent heat content and weight, et cetera, et cetera. But examples by comparison at zero PSIG. All these refrigerants are on the beach at zero pounds. R717 ammonia saturation point is minus 28 degrees. In an open pot at the beach, it would boil at minus 28 degrees. R718 is water, and the saturation point is 212 degrees. R22, the halocarbon, saturation point is minus 42 degrees F. And R290, propane, saturation point is minus 43. Some are very similar, but that's effectively how we define a refrigerant. Pressure temperature relationships of refrigerants. A refrigerant that is going through a change of state at a constant pressure will do so at a constant temperature. So that means the boiling point or the condensing point, as long as the pressure stays the same, the temperatures will stay the same. So let's try and tie everything together. There are four basic components of a mechanical refrigeration system. Here's the four components, the evaporator, the compressor, the condenser, 
and the expansion valve. We have not tied them together yet. We've added a couple components. We still have our evaporator and compressor and condenser, but we added a high pressure receiver and a king valve. Now we've got a little color so you can see it a little better, but here's our evaporator, compressor, condenser. You even have the orange color for the superheated vapor, and as we start condensing, it turns red, and then we are going to drain down to our high pressure receiver and our expansion valve feeds the evaporator. The basic mechanical refrigeration system. Mechanical refrigeration is simply a process of a liquid changing state to a vapor and back again. That's a very good simplified way of thinking of the system. We've got liquid, we change it to vapor, let's take the vapor, recondense it back to liquid, and then we go around and around and around. This process begins when enough heat energy enters the liquid to cause that liquid to evaporate or boil into a vapor. Remember, this liquid had to be the coldest substance in the area for the heat energy to flow into it. This is what happens in the evaporator. The same low pressure vapor then travels through the compressor and enters the high pressure side of the system. At this point when the high pressure, high temperature vapor loses enough heat energy to cool to cooler surroundings, it will condense back into a liquid. This is what happens in the condenser. Now the cycle can be repeated if this high pressure liquid can be properly throttled or metered to the lower pressure or suction pressure side of the system again. This is what happens at the metering device, which can also be called an expansion valve. And this is a transportation system for heat. Let's talk about it that way. Let's start here on this system. Here's our evaporator. And over here in our cold room is our strawberries on the floor. So this evaporator is in the same room as the strawberries. So this is where it all starts. The system is running. There's a fan blowing air out over our strawberries. So the cold air that goes out to the strawberries goes over the warmer strawberries. Remember when you have high energy and low energy molecules touching each other, the energy always goes from high to low so the higher energy strawberries are giving up their energy to the lower temperature air. And the lower temperature air picks up that heat and brings it back to the evaporator. So now the evaporator is the coldest thing in the area. So now the warmer air gives up its heat to the colder evaporator surface. When you put enough heat into the liquid refrigerant, which is represented by the dark blue, enough heat goes into the liquid refrigerant, then we boil it and it ends up being a vapor. The vapor naturally goes by pressure difference because we're creating vapor behind it and we have a low pressure here at the suction of the compressor. The vapor goes to the compressor. Once it gets to the compressor, it compresses it up to a higher pressure. And now the higher pressure is forced over into the condenser, again, all by pressure difference. And as we start making our way through the condenser, remember we've got air blowing over this, water showering over this. The high temperature discharge gas in the discharge line gives up its heat to the cooler air and water that's on the outside of the pipes. And the heat is rejected through the pipe into the air and as the vapor gives up its heat, remember it condenses back into a liquid. We gather that liquid here at the high pressure receiver. We send it out through a king valve to the metering valve, and we go from high pressure to low pressure at the orifice of this valve. Now we're back down to lower pressure liquid. So I'm going to go through this again real quick, but I want to I want to go through the wall of the pipe. Over here, we bring the warm air in as we're picking up heat from the strawberries by air. And the air is carrying the heat back to the outside of this pipe 
and there's fins here too, but there's refrigerant on the inside of the pipe. Well, how does the heat go through the wall of the pipe? It does by the same way we've been talking about, by molecules bouncing off of each other. But the air stays on the outside of the coil. And the strawberries stay over here where the strawberries are. But the heat doesn't. The heat gets picked up by the air and the air goes over the top of these pipes. Now these pipes are colder because they have the refrigerant inside. So the air stays on the outside, the refrigerant stays on the inside of the pipe, whether it's liquid or vapor, low pressure or high pressure. So the ammonia refrigerant stays on the inside of the pipe. The heat that's starting on the outside hits the colder pipe, and now the outside of the pipe is cold, but the inside of the pipe where the refrigerant is, is even colder. So now you have your high energy trying to work through the wall of the pipe to the lower energy, refrigerant. And once the heat gets to the inside of the pipe, then the heat energy actually goes into or transfers into the liquid. Remember, the molecules don't move. The molecules in the refrigerant stay in the refrigerant. The molecules in the pipe stay in the pipe but the molecules still transfer the heat from the outside of the pipe through the wall of the pipe to the inside of the pipe. And then when the liquid refrigerant on the inside of the pipe touches a higher energy molecule, then the energy goes into the liquid refrigerant. Now the liquid refrigerant carries that heat just like a train would carry passengers or tractors or automobiles or lumber. The refrigerant is what carries the heat over to the compressor. The heat started in the strawberries, but the heat's now inside the refrigeration system and we raise the pressure and temperature over here. And now when we get to this side of the system, the refrigerant vapor is on the inside of the pipe. And that's the high temperature. On the outside of the pipe wall is the colder temperature because you've got air and water showering over it. So the refrigerant gives up its heat to the inside wall of the pipe. It travels through the wall of the pipe and gives up its heat finally to the outside of the pipe where the heat energy gets into the cooler air and goes bye-bye and gets dumped out into the atmosphere. As we remove heat from the vapor, it condenses into a liquid, drains into the high-pressure receiver, this is high pressure over here. This is low pressure over here. So when this valve opens, pressure differential pushes this liquid to go through this orifice from high pressure to low pressure. And now we're putting more liquid over here because we've been boiling it off. We have to make it up. So now we put more liquid over here and we bring in colder, low temperature refrigerant. So again, the heat that's coming back from the strawberries will go into the lowest temperature in the whole area, which is the refrigerant inside of this evaporator. If that refrigerant inside of that evaporator wasn't the coldest thing in the area, it wouldn't be a refrigeration system. So we have to run that blue, that blue at a lower temperature, the lowest temperature of all. In this case, if we want our strawberries to be 32 degrees, this refrigerant might be 20 or 22 degrees. And that's, that's how the heat transfers through the walls of the pipe. That's how the refrigerant acts as the, uh, the train cars that carries the heat. The heat started over here. We brought it into the system. It was drawn into the liquid because the liquid is the coldest. When we add enough heat into liquid, it'll boil into a vapor. The vapor travels over here. Now we compress it up from a lower pressure to a higher pressure. We, we compress it to a high enough pressure so that it's hotter. It's at a higher temperature than the outside ambient conditions between the water falling over the tubes and the air that's going by. That's a lot said right there.